Good morning. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I think I've finished my probationary period. They're letting me stay. So uh, I'm very excited to start uh, to start another to start another school term. Uh, I I always think it's funny when we say welcome back or something like that. It's not welcome back. Some of us welcome back, but there've been a lot of people who've been here all summer long. So for those of you who we're off uh, doing exciting adventures elsewhere. Welcome back to you. Uh, for those of you who have been working through the summer to get the campus ready for, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the fall semester, uh, beginning of another, uh, beginning of another uh, exciting term. I don't know about you, but the the return of the the return. I was going to say the return of the swallows, but the return of the students always just fills me with energy. Uh, it's, uh, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting time of the year. So obviously, uh, for me, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a moment of reflection, having, having finished, uh, finished one year here. And now we get to count in years, no longer in months, uh, that have been here. And I will say, I, I, knew, I knew something about the quality of the institution. I knew something about um, how good the, pro the programs were and the, and the things that you all do and the things that our students do. One of the things that's really uh, impressed me uh, and, and now I come to appreciate as the distinctive quality of Montclair State University is just the level of commitment, the level of passion for the university which comes, which comes through, um, not just to me, but to anybody who steps foot on campus. And I was, I was reminded of this uh, once again, just just a few days ago, uh, when I got to meet some of our new students and their families, uh, dropping them off, and while they're bringing their mini fridges and toaster ovens and comforters and stuff into their dorm rooms, uh, they get bothered by the president of the university, which I think they like, and they're also like, who is this guy talking to me, and do you have your pillow? Um, <laughs> but But to a person, to a person, the, the families all comment on the climate of the campus and how it feels and how nice everybody is and how welcoming everybody is. And a lot of credit goes to our, uh, our student development team and the housing team and the great job that they collaborating with facilities do to pull off the logistics. Many people said, you know, this is way better than when I moved my other kid into, I won't name schools, but other New Jersey institutions. Like, you guys really have it down. And my favorite one was like, and you have a tent. There's a tent for us. They were blown away by the tent. But, but every person that comes to this campus is impressed by the nature of the community that we have and the feeling that they get talking to staff, faculty, other students, even just, and I've had many visiting students who look, who say, you know what, you know what caused me to come here? Like I looked around and everybody, they were smiling and they were friendly and they seemed happy to be here. And that enthusiasm, obviously I couldn't have guessed that from afar. Um, and, 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 uh, and now I think of that as being sort of an essential quality of our institution. And it's funny, right? Because the refrain that I often get from people is, uh, Huh, Montclair, I had no idea. And Joe Brennan says that should be our slogan. Mon <laughs> Montclair, I had no idea. It's not, it's not a terrible, it's not a terrible slogan, except it would be better if they did have some idea. So, so we're going to work on that too. But in the interim, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good working slogan. Anyway, here we are, um, and we're gathered together. Yes, it's the start of another year. It's also, it's also September 2022, and it is a, it is a moment. Uh, it is a moment for us in the world. And uh, I think it's. I said it to the students this morning, uh, and I say the same thing to you. I think it's, uh, it's foolhardy, even as we celebrate all the great things that we're doing here and as we are happy about being part of this community, it's foolhardy not to also recognize um, that we're in a moment of tumult and uncertainty. Um, happily, we are to some degree, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but to some degree post-COVID. 
Um, we'll come back to that in a moment, but certainly we're able to have a conversation where the first question out of our mouths isn't COVID, what next, right? So that's good. Um, but our country is still uh, fraught, right? We've got a lot of division. We've got a uncertainty. I'm not, I don't think being melodramatic where I, where I say a lot of us have questions about the state of American democracy and what our future is. Uh, we have a whole lot of public policy challenges, including just in the last couple of weeks, a question which centers on the efficacy of our institution, right? And the debt relief, uh, the debt relief policy that was adopted by the Biden administration. Again, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, and from my point of view, amazingly, a topic which doesn't get enough attention because there's so many other things that rear up on a daily basis, the small matter of uh, whether or not our planet will be able to sustain human life in the years ahead. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the stakes. People always, say, people always say save the planet. Somebody made this point to me a few years ago. People always say save the planet. I was like, you know what? The planet's going to be here. The planet will be here. The question is whether we'll be able to live on it. You don't have to save the planet, save humanity, right? Save the other species that share this planet with us. So yeah, that's, that's sort of out there um, too. And so you say, well, that, that's great. I, that's a real good feel good way to start the talk. <laughs> um, but the reason I say that is I, uh, you know, I am concerned about those things. I do think we have to be attentive to them. And, and at, at this time last year, um, I was talking about criticizing by what we create and I really do think that part of the animating uh, rationale for this institution and what we're doing has to be the response to those realities. It has to be. Um, and for us to, not, for us to not be cognizant of and indeed thinking about our response to those, uh, those circumstances, uh, that would be irresponsible. And it would be inconsistent with our mission as a public serving institution. So I want to talk about I want to talk about a couple of ways or a few ways in which I think we are being responsive. Uh, we are being responsive to those circumstances. Um, and I won't, I won't be able to touch upon everything and I don't want to. I want to try and be more succinct than I, uh, than I, sometimes, uh, than I sometimes am um, and create an opportunity for a conversation. So, so I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be as, as brief as I, as, I, as, I hope to, as I hope I can be. Um, so a couple of things. So let me start with that. Let me start with the, the issue of debt. And, uh, and I, I, could, I could spend the next half hour enumerating the ways in which I think the discourse around the debt relief is incredibly stupid. Um, I won't do that. Um, I, think, I think it's mistaken. I think it's mistaken in the sense of the assumptions about the profile of people who have borrowed money. I think it's mistaken in terms of the, uh, the arguments made about what the economic implications will be of that debt relief. So I think there are a whole bunch of, I think there are a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, but, but my biggest objection is I think it misses the point. It misses the point in the sense that it's not fully grappling with the challenge that students face when, when trying to embrace the possibilities of achieving a college degree. And part of that challenge is financial. There's no doubt about it. And trying to make college affordable. And that's much more than the sort of standard, standard responses like, oh, it's bloated administration. Oh, it's bloated salaries. Oh, right. Oh, it's lazy rivers in the dorms, like all these dumb, all these, Check out the new lazy river in the village. It's really it's fantastic. All these things are sort of dumb mischaracterizations. But the, to my mind, the biggest issue is that students, students don't have a clear pathway, a predictable pathway to getting a degree. And the reality is that the vast majority of students, even students who graduate with some debt, have no problem repaying that debt if they are able to get a degree if they are able to get a degree. And so the part of the conversation that is most misguided is the emphasis on, oh, you know, of course, Jimmy is now getting his loan relief because he got a poetry degree and he's a barista, right? That's, that's a myth, right? The vast majority of outstanding debt is possessed by people who don't have a degree, right? That's the issue, right? And the vast, and, or, and the majority of Pell expenditures in the history of the program have gone to people who do not now have a degree. That's the issue. 
Now, there is some question about expense and so on. I'm not, I'm not putting those, I'm not saying they're irrelevant. I'm saying where, where should the focus be? Now, we are, we are the case for an institution that takes that problem seriously. And so a lot of institutions are, uh, let, me take a, let me take a step back. So this would be our largest first year. For those of you who are not math majors, <laughs> that would make this now our largest first year class ever, joined by approximately 1,200 new transfer students, also our largest number in that category ever, which wouldn't necessarily be the case, but it does result in us having the largest student population in the history of the university. Closing in on, yeah. Closing in, closing in on 22,000 students. Now, a good, part of the, a good part of the credit goes to our incredible uh, admissions and enrollment team led by Wendy Lynn Cook. Fantastic, fantastic job. Um, really being creative, coming up with uh, new ways of giving financial aid that really meets students' needs. And our communications and marketing team getting the message out there so it's, so it's more, yeah, Montclair's really great, not I had no idea. Um, <laughs> So, so that's part of it, but, but, the, but the really essential part of it is that our students are succeeding, that they're graduating at a rate that exceeds other New Jersey institutions, they're, and, and, and even in some ways more pivotally, they're graduating and succeeding at a rate that far exceeds what expectations might be based on a demographic profile, which of course is, uh, is a big ingredient in predicting student success, and they're doing so because they're getting support in every direction that they turn on this campus, right? That we have, we have staff that are, that are committed to their success, we have a fantastic EOF program, point of our colleagues over there, we have a fantastic set of summer bridge programs, we're meeting students sooner, I got to meet uh, high school students, part of the Hispanic Institute, that are excited about going to college and they're getting ready now. So we're doing all those things. We have a faculty that I hear from our students are encouraging and supportive and stimulating and always ready to answer a question when our students come. So I am deeply, uh, deeply appreciative of that. And the reason why those families and those students are willing to invest in sending, uh, sending themselves or sending their loved ones here is because they have a level of confidence that students will succeed here and people are being more and more discriminating about how they want to invest their resources. So what you're starting to see in higher education is sort of a tale of two, two cities, right? You've got some institutions that are growing, like ours, um, and, and there are a couple others in New Jersey that are in the same instance, and then you've got others that are going in the other direction because there's not a level of confidence. So, so, so we can't just say like this is a foregone conclusion and people are gonna keep coming here actually Having, having you know, 400 additional students, and I've said this in every meeting I have, uh, have with the team, um, that actually increases the challenge of us continuing to succeed in the same way. And so I'm very excited by some of the things that are, some of the things that are going on. Uh, Provost Gonzalez, and how about our new provost? <laughs> I said, I, I think I said here last year that I knew it's weird to know in advance that the most, I know what the most important decision I'm going to have to do in the first year would be, and it was getting a new provost, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't be more pleased with how that one turned out. Um, uh, provost Gonzalez has embraced, uh, because he knows uh, very well, this as a central part of his mission, which is to up our game. And so we're looking at everything, how we teach, how we advise, how we coach students, to push even further, right? And I can tell you, you know, we had a, a approximately 82% retention rate. That's, and that's what most people look at. It's kind of funny, the first to second year retention rate is sort of the, is sort of the standard metric by which people judge uh, student success. So we're about 82%, not bad, not bad. And I am generally a glass half full kind of guy, so I'll say that. But it does mean that 20% of our students didn't return who started last year. Mm, that's not so good. 
So we're going to get that. We're going to get it to 85%, and then I'll say we need to get 88%, and then I'll say we need to get to 90%, right? We're going to keep working at that, and we're going to think of it in the whole way. So I'm very excited looking at, as the students say, Dr. S, um, and we're looking at everything we do in SDCL to figure out how can we be supportive of students reconfiguring the set of programs to create an office of student belonging so that there's a level of comfort and place that our students enjoy, which is just as vital to their success as their performance in the classroom. So that will be a central focus for us. It is our response, and this is what I mean by criticized by we create. It is our response to the idea that colleges are indifferent to the outcomes for their students. And I think it is our response to the idea that college isn't worth it, that the degrees don't matter, that it's a waste. That, that's not what our alumni tell me. And I don't know what your, I don't know what your experience is a sense of community, a sense of public good, a sense that we can't only be concerned with self-interest, that we have to think holistically. And this, it, it's an, there's an irony, right? Because there is, there's a way in which, you know, the culture of individualism and liberty, like that, we think of that as being essential to this country's politics and political philosophy. But, but what's gotten lost is the other essential part, which is the ability to act collectively and collaboratively. And so I think, I think we can be a counter, a counter argument that says, yes, individualism matters. Yes, the individual spirit must be cultivated and supported and individual abilities must be celebrated and rewarded. Um, but if we're going to achieve anything, even individually, we have to have a strong community. So that starts internal to our own community. And I will say a word about COVID because I think it's important to note the reason why we got through the last year without going remote and the reason why we had relatively, relatively, and I don't have any wood to knock on, there's no wood. I guess this is wood-ish. <laughs> relatively modest uh, challenges on our campus was because we were able to behave as a community. Right? We didn't have a lot of fighting about masks and so on. We had very good compliance with our vaccinations. Um, we had cooperation between management and labor to come up with agreements that worked for everybody. It was really a powerful illustration of what collective action yields. And of course, we know that in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, we didn't have collection action and we had very different outcomes. So here we are today. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the policies that we have in place are going to work. Um, but we are, we are carefully paying attention to the variables that I said we would pay attention to. What are the hospitalization rates in the county? What is our ability to deal with a wave if it comes about? What are the transmission, possibility, uh, transmission patterns on campus? And we will continue to do so. I think that the key is let's try to remain wary and ready to act as a community if we do because we saw the results of that, and I think we should all be pleased that the results uh, have us here today. Now, acting as a community means building a place where everybody feels comfortable and appreciated and has opportunities. I think that there's a, I think there's a, there's a moment we have now uh, with some of the normalcy being achieved to look carefully at how we function as a community. I'm excited that we are launching a campus climate survey to look at issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, to get a sense of how the campus works. You'll be hearing, uh, you'll be hearing more about that. We want that to be very inclusive, as one would hope, um, to get a lot of different voices about how this is working. I'm very pleased that uh, Dr. Ashante Connor, I thought I saw, her. there she is, uh, is, gonna, is gonna provide leadership for this survey and we're going to be doing that over the next uh, over the next several months there'll be there will be a quantitative component but I'm I'm particularly interested in the qualitative component where people have a chance to articulate uh, what their experiences has been have been good bad somewhere in the middle um, so we get a sense of how this campus works and, and whether or not everybody feels uh, like they have a voice and their presence here is appreciated and just to be clear 
that doesn't mean that like everything's on pause for a year and we're not going to do anything. I think there are opportunities, there are opportunities to address issues um, and to take action even before we get the final, you know, the final report from uh, the, the consultant that's working with us, which is called SOVA. So, so we have to start with our own campus community and we're going to be attentive to that, see how we can make it more inclusive. But I actually think part of what we can do that has impact beyond our own little beautiful community is being more engaged in the community writ large. And you know that that's something that I feel very strongly about. I'm so excited about the things that already happened. I mean, I, I started making a list of the things that I've learned about, um, which when I was with you last year, it's sort of a funny thing. Like, I don't, I don't know, I see a couple of things on the website, but I don't really know. Um, but now I've become more familiar with the university and I just get so excited when I get to talk about it. And, and what a thrill to see some of, the, uh, some of the programs that we do gaining national attention. So many of you probably read about the Red Hawks Rising uh, program in Newark that the Secretary of Education was lauding. For those of you who don't know, uh, this is a partnership with the Newark Schools and the American Federation of Teachers to encourage and support high school students to go to college, to study to be teachers, and put them on a trajectory to go back and teach in their own neighborhoods. Fantastic, fantastic program. I particularly like it. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't, I can't see anything. I don't know if Majda is here or Jennifer Robinson. Are they? No? <laughs> people are making, people are gesturing, but I don't know what that means. Anyway. Um, but but uh, I see Katie, so that's close. Um, <laughs> take a bow, Katie, for them. There you go. So, but I I, particu I particularly like that because it gets back to our roots, right? We are still Montclair Normal School, and the ultimate way, ultimately, uh, our origins lie in a vision that a university can make a difference by preparing teachers. But of course, it doesn't. It doesn't stop there. We've got programs from nursing that are out in the community all the time. I got to be on the Today Show with our nursing, our first year of nursing grads. That was, uh, that was different. <laughs> By the way, I had no idea. Like, we, I show up at Rockefeller Center, and I thought, like, we were just going to be sitting in the student, and, and I'm, I can't, like, I date myself. I'm like, where's Brian Gumbel? And they're like, yeah, Jane Pauley and Brian Gumbel aren't here anymore. I'm like, oh, <laughs> sort of disappointing. But, but I get there. It's funny, right? I get there, and I'm like, I think we're just going to go and sit on a couch. And, they're, and there's, like a whole, there's like a whole graduation set up in the middle of Rockefeller Plaza with, you know, stage. And anyway, and it was funny because the producers, the producers are like, how do we do this? Like, do they walk up? Like, I'm like, chill out. I know how to run a graduation. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. So, but no, that really, that really actually was true. <laughs> but, but so the, the, we've got our Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health doing fantastic work. Um, again, some of these things that not everybody gets to see, a Center for Audiology and Speech Pathology, which is an incredible resource for the community. Those are services that are often not covered by insurance or are not readily accessible, even if people can pay for it with insurance or Medicaid. There's no providers that will accept those things, and so they can't get it. Uh, the Center for Water Science is doing important work. Students getting hands-on learning opportunities as they address the critical issue of water safety. I could go, I could go on at great length. The cool, the cool thing uh, from my point of view is that when I'm out in Patterson, where, as I've talked about, we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time in Patterson, and I think there's a huge opportunity for us to be difference makers real difference makers in a city that has a lot of energy, that has a lot of possibility, but has a lot of challenges, right? And, um, and they, what they lack, uh, they lack what is usually called an anchor institution, but, but beyond that, they lack somebody who's trying to pull all those things together and to really make, and to really make the different initiatives. Because it's, this is not a dead city. This is not a place where people don't care. There's actually a ton of activity in Patterson all kinds of nonprofits, all kinds of civic groups, people who are passionate about improving the city, people who are passionate about improving their own lives. But there's nobody who's taken responsibility for knitting those things together. That's an opportunity for us. 
for us to show what a university can do. If we bring our own activities to bear, and if we try to pull together the things that are already going on, and so there's going to be more announcements in the, in the weeks ahead, but I couldn't be more excited by what's going on there. I have to give a shout out to Brian Murdoch, who I think many people know. Um, Brian's done a phenomenal job for many years uh, leading the charge on community engagement. I think I'm looking at him right there. Is that right? Yes? Okay. This is, by the way, so the good news is like, I can see the bottom half of people's faces. The bad news is I'm like blinded by light. So Brian, Brian's done a fantastic job uh, and, and I'm really excited that we're able to elevate that work. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to announce that Brian is uh, now going to be Associate Vice President for Community Partnerships. Um, and, and we will be launching what we're calling the Community Action Nexus, the purpose of which is to be an interface, an interface um, between the community and the university where we have one basically one central place where folks from the outside can come in and say, here's what we would like to accomplish, can the university help us? And where people inside the university can be aware of what each other is doing and have a resource to help you all connect with the community because that's not always such an easy thing to do. If we're going to be serious about serving the community, and that's what this is about, it's not using the community as a laboratory, it's not a test bed, it's not a data set, Right? It's us serving the interests of the community, using our capabilities to do so. If we're going to be serious about that, you actually have to build some infrastructure to support it. You have to teach people how to do it right, respectfully, and you have to cultivate relationships with the community, build the trust that makes real partnership possible. So that, that will be a central part of what the university is. Great things happening, Patterson. Um, some of the things that are already, already happening, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Reed and Garcia Reed have done uh, interventions in Patterson. There's a lot of different programs. We've done educational programs in Patterson. We will become a central player um, in the revitalization, resurrection, really, of Hinchliffe Stadium. Um, and the museum at Hinchliffe Stadium will essentially become uh, part of Montclair State University. Um, and there will be much more to say, there will be much more to say about what happens in that community. But it's not like we're only going to be in Patterson. Right? This, this notion that we will support healthy communities, this will be a hallmark of this university. And we will show that communities can be stronger, can be brought together. They don't have to be divided if you are, if you are focused on that as your goal. And of course, a big project that's an expression of that commitment is our relationship with Bloomfield College. Again, uh, we're closing in, so we'll be able to do announcements, so I can't make any big whiz-bang announcements right now. Except to say this, um, the, future, uh, the futures of Bloomfield and Montclair are intertwined. Um, and it would, it would have been highly irresponsible uh, for an institution with the mission that we've articulated to serve the public interest to see, uh, to see Bloomfield College founder, an institution that is the only predominantly black institution uh, in New Jersey that has a, a tradition and a legacy of serving the public interest uh, we couldn't, we just couldn't let that, we couldn't let that happen. Um, and we have fantastic partners uh, at the college, very willing, very creative, very committed to figuring out how to make this integrated notion work. The president of Bloomfield, Marquita Evans, has become a, a very close co-conspirator for me um, and is going to be a huge asset, a huge asset to the, to the university. We will be able to do that in a way that not only maintains the legacy of Bloomfield, but the important part is makes us an even stronger institution. Makes us an even stronger institution, innovating uh, in the higher ed space, showing that there are different ways to have uh, educational impact, different ways to maintain alternative models under one, under one umbrella university. So I'm very excited, uh, very excited about that, and I feel confident in that. The state of New Jersey feels confident in that, right? So there, for those of you who are not uh, big state budget followers, you'll note that the state invested, the state invested, what did it end up being, Keith, $12 million? $12.5 million uh, technically in Bloomfield College. But what it was was an investment in our partnership. It was an investment in us. It was a belief that we have a path forward for Bloomfield and the students that Bloomfield College serves. So 
Uh, I think this is going to be an exciting next chapter. As I say, there will be more. There will be more to come on that front. Finally, when it comes to addressing the breakdown of community and society, I think part of what's been lost uh, is a commitment to public service and a commitment to, frankly, democratic institutions. And so we have to we have to be a bulwark. And this sounds melodramatic, I realize this, but we have to be a bulwark for democracy. It's as simple as that. And so part of the reason why I want us to be a leader in public service is because cultivating a generation of, of young people who believe public service is an indispensable part of their lives is about building a cadre of people who are, who are the backbone of a healthy American democracy. And by the way, that's not like I didn't make that up. Like that's what George Washington said um, when he argued for there being uh, basically a public service university. And so I'm excited that we'll be launching our own cohort of the Next Generation Service Corps. This makes us uh, a partner in a now 13 university uh, network of institutions. Uh, this is something that comes out of work that I did at Arizona State University where we launched the first public service academy in the country, actually delivering on this idea that George Washington articulated, and then worked with the Volcker Alliance, uh, a nonprofit started by a New Jersey boy, former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, who recently passed away. Um, so we are now, uh, we are now part of a, uh, an alliance of universities uh, that includes, obviously, ASU, uh, Georgia State, Indiana, uh, Penn State, I could go on uh, with the list, uh, all committed to building public service, and we are going to be leaders of that initiative, which in my, uh, in, in my mind will, will, uh, will reach all 50 states by 2030, um, and we're doing so building on a legacy of public service that we have here. Not only, uh, not only this new program, but we are one of the leading programs in the Bonner uh, program. We have multiple AmeriCorps programs. And I really do think, again, it traces back to our history as a normal school that are preparing people to serve in, uh, as public educators. And so in this, in this set of ways, we are asserting what it means to be committed to community, what it means to be committed to the collective good, what it means to be committed to public service, and at its core, what it means to be committed to democracy. And so I do feel I do feel that in, the, in, this way, uh, in this way we are responding to the challenging moment in a, very, in a very palpable fashion. We can't do any of this. We can't do any of this if we're not attendant to the strength of the institution. I recognize that. And all of this is exciting, and we've got a lot of wheels turning and plates spinning, and choose the metaphor that works for you. Um, that's good. Um, and adding, adding hundreds of new students is good. But if, this, if the institution isn't strong enough to withstand it, then you ultimately are self-defeating. So we have to be attentive to the strength of the institution. Um, we're trying to make some changes on an organizational level, look at everything we do, every process, every procedure, strip it down, see how we can do things better, more efficiently, more effectively. Uh, we are currently uh, searching for a, a, a reconfigured leader of our administrative services. We, have taken the position of the vice president for finance, and we've created a senior vice president for finance and administration. We're searching right now somebody who has overarching responsibility to make the university work as efficiently as and effectively as possible to support all of you uh, in the work that you do. Whatever you do, however, from a structural point of view, and this pains me to say this because I'm like intellectually, I'm a public administration guy, political science. I believe in structure and process, um, but. Ultimately, the people are more important than the structures. Um, and, the, and the way that you support, the way that you support people is more important. So we want to be really attentive. We want to be really attentive to supporting people and adding the talent. We run a lean, I said this when we were talking about the budget. We run a lean organization here. Um, that's important, right? That's important because it goes back to what I first said. How do you make student success possible? Well, you keep it affordable even as you drive quality up. All right. There is such a thing as too lean, <laughs> right? You can't, run you can't run people to the point where they're no longer effective because it's self-defeating. And so we have to make sure that we're, we're in the right spot. We were very pleased that actually with an intellectual argument, uh, I really think that mattered. I know that sounds Pollyanna-ish as a political person, but with an intellectual argument paired with good old political activism, 
we were able to secure an investment from the from the state legislature of uh, that that works out to thirty three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars per student, um, which is more than we were getting before. Um, so that resulted in a twelve million dollar increase from what the budget said. I don't want to get into the weeds a little bit. We did okay. We did okay. Um, but it's going to have to it's going to have to change if we're going to achieve all the things that I've been waxing rhapsodic about. It's going to have to change further. And here's the great here's the great part. We can address those needs and be innovative in who we serve simultaneously. The 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 thing that I think is greatest from the man for for somebody who is responsible for the success of the university is that our goals align. Right? So Yes, we want to be economically viable. We want to be, have the money to pay people, right? We want to be able to do those things. How do we do those things? We do those things by supporting student success, right? Because if we retain students and graduate them, they're paying, and then I can pay all you. <laughs> so that's fantastic. And so all the things that we need to do in order to serve people actually align with our mission. And so just some of the things that we are, some of the things that we are doing I think are going to put us in a strong position both as a university but also economically. So, so we often talk about student success and how do you prepare students to be successful at the university. But we don't talk enough critically about how do we change ourselves to meet students where they are. It's always about the students evolving. It's never about us evolving. Which I always think is funny. Maybe we should, like, people talk about all the barriers, like, well, maybe we should eliminate the barriers instead of teaching people how to jump over them. So the initiative that we call Moncler Unbound is about changing the way we deliver educational uh, programs to our students, to meet them where they want to be. So maybe not every student wants to come to campus every day for class, and maybe not every student wants to study exclusively online. Well, why can't we mix those things together? I don't see any reason. Well, we're not set up to do that, which is true. Well, then we're going to need to change. So that's what, that's, that's what that initiative, that's what that initiative about is. Are we organized intellectually to answer the questions and offer the programs that our students want to see and our community partners want to see? Do we have it right? Maybe not. That's why I'm so gratified that the provost organized a committee to look at our education and health offers and say, well, maybe we should restructure that a little bit. And I, you know, I think we are going to make some, I think we are going to make some changes based on the findings in that committee. And we're going to look at whether we're organized properly to maximize our impact and to meet students where they need to be and to support faculty where they want to be. Maybe we could be more attractive to international students. I think this is a fantastic destination for international students. And yet we don't have many. Um, and that would be really important to building a, a, a not only a financially uh, stronger model, but also a more diverse campus community, which gives opportunities to learn from students from different backgrounds. So we're going to figure out how to do that. We're already, we're already uh, engaging partners to help us identify international students and, uh, and have now inter the, the question, Montclair, I didn't know that, translated into multiple different languages. <laughs> so, 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 so these are the kinds of things that we're going to do and in order, to, in order to meet those aspirations, we're constantly adding new talent, new voices. The slides that you saw playing at the beginning give you some, give you some sense of that. I asked just for, uh, just for some examples. So uh, I don't know. So I, I just got an example. And I don't know if he's here. So I'll board. Is, is Christo Suriano here by any chance? I don't know how he got, he, he got stuck on my sheet, like a tough break for him. But, but Dr. Suriano joins us in neurobiology, uh, just came from a postdoc at uh, Princeton, decent school down the road. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he's investigating the immune response. I'm going to read it because if I try and paraphrase, I'll get it wrong. How the immune response to adeno-associated virus can disrupt neuronal structure and function. Okay. That sounds good. Um, but the, part that's in, the other part that's interesting, he's talking about RNA, the effect of RNA viruses. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting to me is you know, this, this seemingly obscure intellectual stuff. That seemingly obscure stuff, that's what led to the COVID vaccine. It seemed obscure 20 years ago. It doesn't seem so obscure now. So 
So I don't, when we talk about community engaged research and research that leads to solutions, I don't want for a minute people to think, oh, well, there, there's, a, there's a lack of interest in basic research, there's a lack of interest in the kind of work that I do. There are different ways that we arrive at solutions. And I'm excited about the growth of our research across the board in, in, uh, in every area, and we're going we're gonna to continue into that. I'm also, uh, I'm also wanted to take a moment to uh, uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Pavel Lucian uh, to the campus. <clears throat> and I don't know, is he here? Welcome. Very good to have you here. So, so, so Dr. Lucian uh, is a former chair of the psychology department uh, at the University for Education Management and the Academy for Educational Studies in Kyiv. Um, a, a widely published author, a recipient of many medals from the Ukrainian government, um, a member of the National Academy of the Sciences in Ukraine, uh, and unfortunately joins us because of the horrors uh, going on in his country and the, the, the really shameful, shameful crimes against humanity that are being perpetrated on, on this nation. Um, it is a very, in some ways, a very small voice that we raise by being able to welcome Dr. Lucian to Montclair State University. But we are delighted that we are able to do that and thrilled to have you here uh, and obviously hope that in the future you can return to your home uh, uh, in a different state. So welcome, welcome very much to the university. And, and finally, I do want to, to the, we, do, we do have a great group of leaders, and I want to introduce one new leader that we welcome to the campus, uh, Althea Broomfield. Michelle, where'd she go? She was here a second ago. There you go. So I'm going to make you stand up. So, so Althea, Althea joined us. What are you in week, week three? How many weeks have you been here now? Four weeks. Uh, as our new university council comes to us, uh, comes to us from uh, Columbia University, actually Teachers College, appropriately enough, um, yes, and uh, and has a history before that working in New York City government. So she will not be impressed by our bureaucracy. Um, and uh, very excited, very excited, uh, you know, to have Althea here, and she's embraced the challenge of making us more entrepreneurial. Uh, more responsive, more creative, more risk-taking, which you don't, you, you, don't, you don't get lawyers who like to take risks very much. So, so, uh, so we couldn't be more thrilled, uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to have her, to have her as part of this team. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop there uh, and simply say I am so, uh, I am so thrilled um, by what we've, what we've gotten in motion over the last, uh, over the last year. Um, really what it's done is to whet my appetite for the possibilities of working together. Uh, it's a real privilege to be, to be your partner, but more importantly, it's a real privilege to be part of an institution that I think is poised, uh, poised to make a real difference in the world and show not just in New Jersey, uh, but beyond what a university, uh, what a university can be. And uh, it's a way to do proud. I, I started last year and I'll finish this year by noting by noting uh, that this university is situated on the, on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. Um, and one of, the things that I, one of the things that I felt was important when I came to appreciate uh, Native American history in Arizona was to connect, to connect what we were doing to that heritage. And part of the way we honor uh, that heritage and to appreciate the values uh, and uh, and culture of those people is to embrace uh, is to embrace them in what we do, uh, and and the emphasis on community, uh, the care for our planet, the thought regarding the generations that come after us. These are all values that come through from those communities, uh, and so we honor we honor our history and we honor the challenges of that history by taking the strongest elements from them and manifest them, manifesting them in what we do. And so uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a start, 
uh, but we're going to continue to do great things together, and I can't wait. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have about 15 minutes. Uh, if, we want, if there are questions, things that you would like to hear. I know you just heard me talk for a long time, so you may be like, that was plenty. Um, but if there are things that people want to talk about, we have a couple of microphones. David, I'm quite, you don't let me down, David. No. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have sympathy because I hate when I'm the instructor and, and no one speaks up. So I, I, I don't want to let I, you down. I just want to say, I'm a pro. A, a silent room does not, does not phase me. I know you've all been there. I can sit in a silent room longer than you. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. Right. So on, uh, on Friday, there's going to be this uh, special Board of Trustees meeting. So trying to take advantage of, of opportunities, but and then also approval of this uh, capital plan. So I was wondering if you could say something about how does Montclair Unbound and our physical plant relate? I mean, my understanding is like there were, you know, Overlook has been overlooking us for many years and thinking about that has changed, mm -hmm. but you haven't given up on our physical plant even with Unbound. So if you could say something about yeah. all that. Yeah, so, uh, so just for those, because obviously David has more information than some of you do. So the, the state uh, has authorized a $400 million bond offering. And so the way it works is there's this pool of money that's put out there that the state's, uh, basically the state's going to borrow and then we can apply to participate in that bond offering. And so what we do and every other university in New Jersey at least considers doing, I don't know if everybody will apply, we propose projects, um, we propose projects that, uh, that we think should be eligible for that funding. Um, and so actually, it probably won't happen on Friday because the deadline got pushed back, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so, uh, so we have three projects that we think fit with this and that we're putting out there. And, the, and, and those include one very much related to Montclair Unbound, I would say. One is the, to help cover the costs of maintaining our uh, our network capacity on the campus to update our Wi-Fi. You know, the, as, as you know, right, the demands have increased every year. And if we're going to be contemporary and if we're going to have people learning um, and teaching in different ways, we have to have the infrastructure to support that. And honestly, we are going to have to figure out a way to pay for that anyway. So this is a good way to get bond money to go for it. Candy's nodding gravely. Um, <laughs> um, so that's one, that's one proposed uh, project. A second proposed uh, project, which is the biggest, the biggest uh, of the three, uh, would be a new interdisciplinary research facility, um, which uh, the, the, we have, uh, you know, in some ways we have a rich man's problem, right? We have so many faculty who are submitting grants and getting projects that we're running out of space. Um, and uh, we have so many new students coming in that uh, Laura's trying to figure out how to put labs in, in spaces that are not labs. Um, and so we need, to, we need to grow our footprint in that regard. And building wet labs and research facilities is incredibly expensive. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, not only build a new, a new space for, uh, for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work, uh, but also renovate Richardson further. Those of you who are in Richardson know we did some of it, but not all of it, um, so that we would be able to do more uh, to support the capacity to grow our research enterprise further. Um, third project, uh, which is uh, very exciting, is to completely reimagine uh, what Sprague uh, Library is and does in the years ahead. Um, if you go into Sprague Library, it looks very much like a library looked in the 70s and it's like, a lot of books. Um, it's not so much how people learn these days. So. We see this as a teaching, learning, knowledge-making commons, uh, where there are spaces for collaboration, where there are new ways to interact uh, with information, where there are maker spaces for students to learn by doing, basically a complete reimagining of what that building is. I don't even want to use the word library because I think we are, we are sort of post-library in the way we typically conceive of it. And so this is an opportunity to jumpstart that process, and it very much in my opinion, it's very much an expression of the notion that we need to adapt ourselves 
to how people learn rather than asking people to do the same old thing. Um, so those are the three projects that we're proposing. Will we get all three? Probably not. Um, and so it's also a useful exercise to compel us to ask what do we want to do, what do we want to be, how do we want to grow in the, in the years ahead. I think we'll get some of it. We just won't get all of it. Hi, uh, Doug Larkin, Department of Teaching and Learning. Hi, Doug. Um, I wonder if you can say a little bit more, uh, you mentioned the transfer students. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about um, how you're thinking about our relationship with our community college partners, particularly, um, you know, you spoke about Red Hawks Rising and, and preparing teachers. I'm thinking about the, the teacher labor crisis that we have right now yeah. and the pressure that we have to uh, maybe figure out ways that we can move people from the community college to here. But I, I, I feel like I even I've been paying attention, but I don't have a good sense of where we are as an institution vis-a-vis -vis our community. Yeah, no. I, so first of all, that thank you so much. Like, because I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you're like, you know, you have a thing in your community college, uh, in your notes about community colleges, and you didn't get to that. So thank you. Um, so fantastic question. So um, I actually uh, I think that our relationship with community colleges is going to be key to our being successful in the future. We, to be honest, we were not seen as a particularly community college friendly university in the landscape of New Jersey higher ed. Uh, in, when was it, in January, I guess, uh, we invited and I invited all the presidents of other community colleges to come along with their leadership team to the university. I think we had 10 colleges came. Um, they were a little bit confused by the whole thing. They're like, what? We're being invited to Montclair by the president? Um, so it was a little bit, but they were extremely excited and a, a huge amount came out of that very quickly. So uh, the most visible, uh, the most visible partnership came as, is a partnership with Union County College where we're offering, where we started our first master's student cohort. I don't know if they've met yet as a, as a class two nights ago. So we, I think for about 15 students uh, started a degree program at Union County College, but I, that's just the beginning. We've signed multiple agreements. We already have a very robust partnerships with community colleges. I don't want to pretend that we don't, we, you know, as obviously we have 1,200 students who are coming from community colleges. And, and I will say that what the presidents of these other colleges have said to me is our, we have a lot of confidence when our students go to Montclair because when, when they go there, they succeed. Um, and so that's a really powerful thing. I think in the future, pathways from community colleges to Montclair are going to be a key way that we meet student need. I've, I've noticed that um, with the Garden State Guarantee and some of these other state programs, what a lot of our, what a lot of our four year peers have been doing is trying to lure students to their universities who might otherwise go to a community college. Um, and I have very mixed feelings about that. Let me put it that way. On the one hand, I, I get it. Uh, I get it and I think it's partially economically driven. But I think it's, all, I, I don't want to be overly harsh. I, you know, I think it's also driven by a belief that a four-year experience at a, at a, at a four-year college is substantively, qualitatively different. I don't, however, think that it's necessarily the best pathway for every student. Um, and so I, I've talked about, and, uh, and I, want to, I want to be a leader in this, why don't we work with our community college partners to create a four year, a clear predefined four year path that starts at a community college um, but ends at Montclair. And how do we construct that so the student, even, even in their first two years, whether it's at Bergen or Passaic, whatever, they're already identifying as a Montclair student. And they're taking every class and they know, they know that every class that they take is gonna count towards their Montclair degree. And, and Junia says, and maybe they take a class a semester here even as they're, uh, even though they're a student at the community college, how do we make them feel like they're part of our community, to go back to that idea, even before they're fully matriculated here? Why can't they have a Montclair ID card? Why can't they have access to some of our IT resources or our library resources or student support resources, even though they're not our student yet? I think that's a way that we create a much more inclusive set of pathways for students and that, that's, what, that's, what I hope we, that's what I hope we develop, right? This is this notion that you can accomplish more in partnership than necessarily uh, you can by yourself. 
and and I, I don't think I don't think four-year colleges can do this can do this alone. And to your specific point about addressing the teaching the teaching needs, I think that's a lot. That's a possibility there, right? That you can put people on pathways with that with that destination in mind. Oh, this is upstairs? Yes. Okay, Hello. We're upstairs. I'm okay. Adele Basil, Office of the Registrar. Um, it's fantastic that enrollment is up. However, I want to know what are the university's plans to support faculty and staff in terms of handling the increase so that we can continue to support students in an effective way? Yeah, we have to grow, obviously, the capacity. That's what I'm saying. Like, you can't just keep adding. Um, and we were just talking about this yesterday, how quickly can we add uh, the, necessary, the necessary capacity so that, so that uh, you, know, we don't, you know, we don't groan and break under the increased load. Um, the, the, the part of the challenge is not so e people don't grow on trees. Um, so it's not so easy to just add, right? The, the, we're trying to add faculty, and I don't know, the provost maybe can say a word or two about this. Um, the, the, the challenge is finding the people to add. I don't know, do you wanna, do you wanna address that, Junius? No, it's, uh, I've heard from folks and appreciate everyone's efforts. Uh, part of it is in certain disciplines, et cetera, it's very difficult even to get um, adjunct faculty, et cetera. And so everybody's sort of scouring the bushes. I will say, which I think the president was going to mention, uh, that we will have the largest number of full-time faculty searches underway this year in at least five years, right? Uh, and then we're also looking at different staffing models. Uh, I know many of you have faced uh, failed searches, uh, as I have for certain staff positions, and so it's really tough. I was just on a call today with other provosts across the country about the market and how um, challenging market forces are uh, in not sometimes not helping us get done what we need to do. Go ahead. Hi, Stephanie Smith from Martin Design. Um, my question is directly related to hiring. What specific steps are you all taking to ensure diversity in hiring? And not just race and gender, but a lot of intersectional backgrounds. Um, and in a way that is not going to further burden the people of color on our campus in the search committee. Yeah, I think that, and I don't do you wanna, do you wanna take a first crack at that, Junius, or go ahead? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, so it is incredibly challenging. You're absolutely right. What's the definition of diversity? I've started those conversations with folks in HR, uh, and we're gonna have a particular meeting about it, and you're absolutely right. Certain people traditionally have been overburdened in a sense. There are some interesting structural issues which I won't get into and we'll discuss with the union leadership about when we're in a pinch, right? Um, and we're struggling to increase diversity overall. We're gonna need, shall I say, sort of more hands on deck. I do wanna thank some of the deans who have already uh, responded to uh, my request uh, to include folks from other departments, faculty from other departments on searches, uh, in part for interdisciplinary sort of thinking, uh, in part for diversity, but in part for a bigger sense, I think, of inclusion in those. And I totally underscore that it's diversity in every sense, right? Yes, racial and ethnic, but disability, um, background, status, you name it. Um, we have to be cognizant of it. I, what, I, what I don't want, and I think the provost is sort of alluding to this, I don't want to have this sort of bean county mentality where it's like, well, you've got one of these, you've got one of these, you've got... because first of all, that is what leads to the situation that you're describing. Um, there, and second of all, because I think that creates a mindset which is not really the right approach. So yes, we have to think about diversity of representation, but we also have to think about the process that we're using and how we're approaching it and, and are we evaluating candidates uh, through lenses that predispose us to certain outcomes. Um, so it, it, it's about representation, but I think on some level, as fundamentally, it's about the way that we approach the process and uh, breaking habits that we may not want to recognize that we, uh, that we possess. We're, we're literally, I'm, so I have a giant clock staring at me in the face, which is really good discipline. So we'll take one last question and then we'll, 
We'll say it's a wrap. Good afternoon, Ali Boak, Director of the Global Center on Human Trafficking. And I just want to say I'm really excited to hear about all this conversation about rethinking hiring. And um, as a center that does a lot of work with communities all over the world, I think we even need to think about educational requirements and what does it mean that somebody can actually do a job. So for example, we're really committed to a survivor-informed approach and we want to hire survivors. Many survivors didn't even go to college. They have GEDs, but some of them you know, can run circles around what I can do. So I just want to make a comment that um, I'm really excited about that. And if I can be involved in any way, please let me know. Yeah. I, I, it is as well. So I'm mean, Ali, obviously Ali and I work together. We, I'm very familiar with the work she's doing. I will say, we do we do have a dog in the fight on the value of educational credentials. <laughs> so so it would be disingenuous if I said, yeah, educational credentials. What are they worth anyway? I'm like, <laughs> I'm probably not going to go down that road too far. But we do have to be. We do have to be. Uh, we do have to be open to uh, appreciating the value that people's backgrounds, people's backgrounds bring. Uh, I've I'm uh, I've been very active in trying to uh, ensure that people who have a criminal record are not discounted and excluded from employment, and that's something that I think needs to be uh, needs to be carefully worked through. There obviously are always issues with that, but but you know people have complex lives and complex histories, and we shouldn't. We shouldn't be so willing to dismiss somebody based on their based on their past, and in fact, we should see the value, as you do, uh, in people's experience, actually giving them insights that otherwise we wouldn't have access to. So uh, that has to be part of the way we view human beings in a, in a holistic fashion. Anyway, I will let everybody go. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to have another great uh, we'll have another great thing, and I'll put an advertisement. Uh, we have the, uh, it's my, I know it's about me, my investiture, I don't like to talk about it that way. Um, I think of it much more as a celebration of the institution. And we have that coming up in a couple weeks, and I would encourage people, even if you don't want to sit through the ceremonial part, we're going to have a fantastic uh, campus festival, which will really celebrate a lot of the stuff that I talked about today and the great work that you and your colleagues are doing. So I'd encourage people to be part of that on September 15th. Thank you very much, everybody. Everyone is invited to Lot 17 by the Recreation Center for an opening day lunch and carnival.